First things first, let's review some definitions. The main sequence is a feature of the HR diagram that runs diagonally across the diagram. The top left corner represents the hottest and brightest stars on the diagram, and the bottom right corner represents the coolest and dimmest ones. A main sequence star is, well, a star that's on the main sequence of the HR diagram, but more specifically, it is a star that is fusing hydrogen into helium in its core through the proton-proton chain of thermonuclear fusion, while also having a surface temperature and a luminosity that places it on the main sequence. The cores of these main sequence stars have achieved a state of hydrostatic equilibrium, a condition where the outward pressure force from the high rate of proton-proton fusion in the core balances against the inward force of gravity of the star's own weight. The third definition for us to become familiar with is ZAMS. Now, this is an acronym standing for the Zero Age Main Sequence. It's the line along the main sequence where the stars that have just achieved hydrostatic equilibrium would be positioned, usually on the left-hand side of the main sequence itself. When a star first becomes a main sequence star, it joins the main sequence on the ZAMS line. Now let's talk some star stats. How many and of what type of stars can we find in the main sequence alone? For every single 10 solar mass star in the main sequence, there are 10 stars within 2 and 10 solar masses, 50 stars within half and 2 solar masses, like our own sun, and a couple hundred stars all under half a solar mass. But why is that? Why are there so very few of the large stars and so many more of the teeny tiny ones? To answer our question, we must ask ourselves another one. How big can a star actually be before it grows increasingly unstable? Astronomers have observed and measured the masses of the stars in the Arches Cluster, a star cluster containing around 135 young stars shown here at the center of the image to help answer this question. This diagram demonstrates the relationship between the different stellar mass values of the stars in the Arches cluster and the number of stars that could be found within each range. A survey of those stars shows an upper limit to the mass of these stars. In theory, a cluster that's this massive should have stars weighing in correspondingly at hundreds of solar masses, but apparently the star-forming processes in the present-day universe reach a practical limiting weight for stars. Right around 150 solar masses, we reach that practical limit. Anything above 150 solar masses falls within the theoretical growth range, meaning it's not likely for stars that massive to exist, though we have actually detected some stars that are currently, and most likely temporarily, greater than 150 solar masses. So we have an idea now of some of these stellar mass statistics, so let's look at the details that explain why the limits are what they are. At the lower end, no stars exist below 0.08 solar masses. That's because a star with a mass lower than that amount does not have enough mass to raise the temperature and pressure levels in its core to kickstart nuclear fusion. We call these failed stars brown dwarfs. As you can see here, some of these brown dwarfs are just about the size and temperature in some cases of our neighboring planet Jupiter. Now, these would-be stars just don't have the right conditions to induce thermonuclear fusion, so they are brown dwarfs. Stars that would have been, but aren't. But back to the stats. On the other hand, what's the upper limit for the mass of stars? Well, as it turns out, there's no clear cutoff for it. We did mention earlier that the cutoff is 150 solar masses, but that's just for one singular star cluster. In general, the current estimate is anywhere between 100 to 200 solar masses. A generally wide range, but for good reason. Stars beyond 150 solar masses tend to grow increasingly unstable. Now I'm sure you're curious, where can we look to find such a massive star? Well, one of the most massive stars to date can be found by looking in the night sky from anywhere south of our equator. Specifically, we're talking about looking at a particularly unique feature of the southern skies, a distant galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud. 
This unassuming image of a bunch of blurry stars actually contains an image of the largest known star yet, a star called R136A1 or RMC 136A1. Labeled as such for its discovery during observations in the 1960s at Radcliffe Observatory in Oxford, England, of the Large Magellanic Cloud itself. But this is an image from 2010. Let's get with the times and see a more updated image with better resolution. Here's an image from just a few months ago. This one, published on the 18th of August, 2022, shows the central stars of the RMC 136 group distinctly separated from one another. The three most massive stars in this group are labeled RMC 136A1, A2, and A3. These three stars are ranked in order of most to least massive. And just in the last six years, estimates for their masses have continuously changed, improving as time progressed. According to one publication from 2016, these stars were 315, 195, and 180 solar masses. A 2020 publication updated these values to 251, 211, and 181 solar masses. The most recent values, published in an article from August of 2022, places these stars at 196, 151, and 155 solar masses. Although these values are getting smaller, so are their margins of error, meaning that these measurements are becoming more and more accurate as we continue to study these extremely massive stars and many like them.